guys what's up world hope everybody's had a good week uh today here on this thursday night once again we have psychiatrist of integrated medicine dr william bridge how are you william hey Juan, i'm doing well man thanks again for having me on uh how's your week been oh man my my week's been pretty good a couple things here and there but it's always uh blissful and blissful to be alive um william i'm i'm so happy that you're here today to talk about um, depression. And the last two times you've been on this podcast and a guest on this podcast that I really admire you for coming on, we talked about the difference between psychology versus psychiatry. The last podcast, the second one, which was an amazing podcast, we, it was called Understanding Anxiety. We got into the depth of what is anxiety and the type of treatment modalities that are used and why it's important. And today, talking about depression, which is um, I think the highly, the, the, the highest diagnosed uh, mental disorder that there is, uh, what is depression? And depression can be turned into a lot of different, can be turned a lot of different ways. Depression is anger turned inward. Depression is a chemical imbalance. Depression is a mental illness. Depression is resistance to what is. Depression is physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, relationship, and career financial pain. In the end, depression is beautiful because sometimes it can help us grow. But what's your take on depression? And I think that's a good way to start this podcast, William, defining exactly what is depression. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, um, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about depression and, you know, whether or not it's, uh, you know, a, a condition that you think somebody needs criteria for, um, you know, as we had talked about in the anxiety uh, podcast, you know, of course, you want to uh, separate it out from, you know, your uh, typical daily emotions. You know, this is, this is different uh, than sadness in the sense that, you know, you have, uh, you know, eight or nine specific uh, criteria, um, and at least five of those things are met for a two-week consecutive period of time. So, um, you know, kind of uh, briefly going over some of the uh, criteria, uh, you know, the uh, mnemonic uh, in the medical field that we kind of go by when we're, you know, screening for depression in a psychiatric interview um, is uh, SIGI CAPS, and really that's a, a mnemonic that, uh, you know, stands for, of course, the S is for changes in sleep. Um, the I is going to be for irritability. Uh, the G is for guilt. So do you have an excess guilt for unknown reasons or unclear reasons? Um, the E is for uh, energy. So are you more fatigued or do you not have as much motivation that you, you did uh, at one point when things were going better? Um, the uh, C is for concentration. Do you have an inability to focus on things that need to get done either at work or at home? Um, the A is for anhedonia. So that's basically, you know, uh, a fancy way of saying, have you lost uh, pleasure in those things that you used to find pleasurable, you know, so if you used to like gardening or, you know, you used to like reading and all of a sudden these are uh, interests that you're no longer carrying, that's a, that's a, a huge remarkable thing and uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, the, the P is, uh, you know, something that uh, we don't see too much of. Uh, it can be present, but it's a psychomotor uh, reduction. So actually, you know, patient actually having difficulty with the uh, everyday tasks that include moving. So, you know, cleaning up the house has now become difficult or they almost describe like a lead-like feeling within the legs or extremities. Um, and then the S, of course, you know, we, we always want to make sure, uh, you know, that's the big one when it comes to hospitalization is uh, uh, suicidal thinking. Um, and I really like those um, definitions or, um, you know, terms associated with uh, depression that you started with. Um, you know, a, a favorite uh, one of mine um, that really summarizes uh, depression without, uh, you know, uh, making it too complicated is uh, uh, depression is an inability to construct a future um, because it really just, uh, you know, summarizes the um, illness in the thought pattern. Um, and, uh, you know, really, uh, like you said, depression just uh, affects so many millions of people in the, the States and worldwide. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a great topic to, to talk about. So, um, hopefully we can answer a lot of questions that, uh, that people out there have. The, man, that was such great information, William. And I'm going to read a little bit of something from the American Psychiatric Association. And this is quote unquote right from their website. 
Depression is a common and serious medical illness that negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and how you act, which is uh, fairly obvious why maybe CBT is a great form and treatment modality to, or treatment orientation um, to engage in with someone that's struggling with the symptoms of depression. But you mentioned the DSM-5, William, and how there's certain criteria that have to be met for a minimum of two weeks. So just to talk about those depression um, a little bit, oftentimes when people meet the criteria for a specific diagnosis, they mm -hmm. immediately think those that aren't aware, which is why we started this podcast together is to raise mental health awarenesses. They think that it's lifelong, that there's no way around it, that there's no, um, that there's, that's it. It, it, was, it must be a genetic component and that's all there is. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. And I want to make that clear. Um, there's diff someone can meet the criteria for depression and it not be lifelong. And, and can you agree with that? Or can you elaborate a little bit about that, William? Yes, I mean, absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, the biggest thing is it's a, you know, term that at some point, uh, you know, can be overused. You want to, uh, you know, first off, make sure that it's uh, applicable and you, you agree that there's a depressed uh, state that's uh, on board with that patient. So, um, when it comes to, um, you know, kind of separating everything out, I would say that um, absolutely the, the first thing that I um, ask the patient when it, when it comes to the, you know, more detail oriented questions with depression is, you know, uh, what did they identify as the acute stressors in their life? You know, so, um, you know, there is such thing as, you know, normal bereavement or, you know, if you had a loss of somebody that uh, was close to you, it's important to realize that it is an entirely normal human emotion uh, to be upset. And you can imagine if you run through those criteria, if, you know, something, and it doesn't have to be a loss, you know, it, it could be a firing from a job. It could be, uh, you know, a child having to be pulled out of school because they have a military family and have been relocated. So, um, you know, you want to make sure that it's not a, a adjustment uh, to something that, uh, um, you know, could be, you know, easily explained as a normal human emotion. Um, and, you know, um, I would say that uh, absolutely you want to make sure that, you know, if they identify um, those stressors that it's important that you you uh, circle back around and you know try to get them to that point in their life before you know they were feeling the way that they uh, that they are in their office. Um, th thanks for sharing that, William. The when I was in my master's program because I'm a recent graduate with uh, my my degree in mental health, the way they taught us was to separate depression almost was like in two categories. And um, tell me if this makes any sense situational depression versus almost like a long, like a long-term type of depression where um, situation and meaning where you were just mentioning, there's a trigger, right? Such as a military member going away from their family or their dad going away, something such as divorce, loss of a job, the death of a close friend, a serious accident, something mm -hmm. that occurs that leaves the person stunned or leaves the person feeling like it, the, the relationship ended too quick or whatnot. But just when someone meets the criteria, let's say someone, they had a life event where they broke up with their girlfriend or their boyfriend, and all of a sudden they meet the criteria for depression for the next month. Yes, that person is struggling with depression, but it's like you said, it's mostly a, a situational, um, situational. It's acute. And is that what you were mostly trying to get at? Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. So, uh, you know, to circle back around and, um, you know, uh, answer the question uh, that you'd ask about, you know, uh, once you get diagnosed with uh, depression, is that uh, uh, diagnosis that you will uh, forever carry? Um, you know, the answer to that is no. Um, you know, uh, and I see a lot of patients that tell me, you know, when I was in my 20s, um, you know, uh, finishing up college, I had a bout of depression. And, um, you know, just to speak to that a little bit is that when we say somebody has depression, let's say they meet criteria, get the diagnosis, you then um, qualify it or specify it as, you know, is this an initial episode? 
or is this a recurrent episode? Um, and you will also mention as well as, you know, if, you know, the depression is getting better, is this a, you know, a partial remission? And usually the way that we screen uh, for that is that, you know, my personal approach, and there's no, there's no uh, written right or wrong way, but, you know, I prefer that if it comes to medications and therapy and a patient is doing well, they feel as though, um, you know, for a uh, four to six month stretch of time, they are uh, basically depression free. Um, you know, at that case, uh, you know, when that comes up, you know, we screen them uh, with, you know, questionnaires, I mean, um, to help kind of give us an objective measurement is, you know, now, uh, you know, their, their screening test is uh, 15. And the last time I saw them in September, it was 20. So you're, you're working, getting this number that asks, you know, are you having trouble sleeping? Uh, are you noticing issues with motivation? And if um, their numbers get better, that's, that's uh, one thing. And I would put that aside, but seeing the patient, you get to build a rapport and you, you can tell, you know, is this somebody that, um, you know, uh, is getting well enough to consider a reduction in medicine um, and you just do it in a very clinically based uh, methodical way um, because the most common and one of the more dangerous things I see in mental health and psychiatry is that um, you know individuals uh, feel that they're getting better um, and they think uh, that it's not the medicine that they have recovered um, and they stop the medicine thinking that they um, you know, don't need it anymore because they're doing so well. And then not only do they have side effects from abruptly stopping the medicine, but they, they can many times realize that, uh, you know, it was the medicine that was keeping them in that, uh, you know, a state uh, of absent depressive symptoms. Well, I, you, I wasn't expecting you to mention that um, so early in the podcast, but I'm glad you did. And I hope you don't mind me asking this question. Um, because you are a psychiatrist, William, and you are, you have a lot of experience when someone, because I have clients, right. That they tell me sometimes I'll recommend them. I'll start, I'll start off treatment by not asking them to go see the psychiatrist, even though I know they're struggling either, um, with behavioral issues or, or ADHD, which is different from depression. But I do have, I've had a clients before that they struggled with the symptoms of depression. They meet the criteria and they don't want to take the medication because of the side effects. Uh, and we, we've gotten into this before. We've talked about this. At one point, do you, do you say, hey, this is enough. Um, I know you're feeling better. I know that you don't, you're not attributing it to the medication. But um, instead of just going completely off it, we're just going to slowly do it. Do you ever get maybe a, a kickback from the client saying, no, I'm just going to stop it cold turkey? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's definitely something uh, that comes up and, um, you know, a, a different, uh, you know, uh, I guess, um, diagnosis that was added to the more recent uh, updated DSM-5 uh, was uh, an acute discontinuation syndrome, which is actually, um, in the most uh, simplistic terms, is a, almost uh, as though the patient has a flu-like syndrome following abrupt discontinuation of medicine. So, um, you know, it used to kind of be this uh, thing uh, that, you know, we felt was, uh, you know, out there, but we really didn't have the studies to uh, uh, back it. However, now, um, you know, it's, it's definitely something I, I've seen it, uh, you know, I, I can't even tell you probably 30 or 40 times. Uh, it's just very common depending on uh, which medicine it is that is stopped. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you as well, I mean, just like what you were saying, you know, during that initial evaluation and, uh, you know, like you said, I think that it is completely appropriate to, you know, deem whether or not this patient needs to see a psychiatrist or, you know, is therapy and psychotherapy, is that enough to get them through um, uh, depression uh, on, you know, uh, the setting where they're not taking medicines? Because, um, you know, I always offer them the, the option of no medicine and therapy because um, they work equally good. But uh, I think that what a lot of people don't know is that uh, um, they work better together. Um, and studies have really proven that over and over again. And, you know, of course, maybe I'm biased, but I, you've heard me say before that, 
you know, I think in a, a, you know, a perfect world, everybody would be able to talk with a therapist, a psychiatrist, because, you know, everybody uh, needs somebody to, to talk to. And I, I think when you have somebody who's knowledgeable about, you know, the, the content of what their thoughts are consumed by, um, it's, it's all the better. So, you know, you know, agreeing or, um, you know, uh, getting set up with a, an appointment with a mental health professional doesn't mean that you're going to get stamped with a diagnosis or walk off with a medication. I, um, you know, majority of what I do is stopping and discontinuing medicines yeah. to find out and, what's what. And, and um, thanks, thanks for sharing that. Uh, I can see that you're a great clinician, William. When I have clients that are struggling with uh, what I call situational depression, which once again, mm -hmm. it's a situation that's presented themselves, that has presented itself when the client's struggling, they meet the criteria for depression. Um, I tend not to refer them to a psychiatrist when it's situational, but when it's clinical, when it's, there's a history, um, then, then I'm, I'm more adamant about saying, Hey, you need to, you, I'm going to refer you to the, to the agency psychiatrist. She comes on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, whatnot. Uh, so when someone's struggling with a situation that's presented themselves in their lives and they meeting the criteria for depression, you're, you're somewhat hesitant in prescribing any sort of medication. Is that, is that um, the picture that I painted in my mind? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times, so, you know, kind of taking you through uh, this scenario that I see most frequently during an initial evaluation. So, you know, whether it's in the hospital or in the clinic, um, you know, there can kind of be um, a generalization about uh, uh, mental health providers in that, uh, you know, well, the internal medicine team, uh, called the psychiatrist. So you walk in and, uh, you know, one of the initial things that I hear very commonly is, um, I can tell you right away, I'm not crazy, you know, so um, that's kind of the stigma that that goes along with, uh, um, you know, mental health. And, you know, I think it's uh, important to explain to the, the patients is that, uh, you know, uh, there is uh, not going to be any judgments. I mean, it's quite possible, you know, I'd say 50% of all the consults I'm called for, um, it's not an appropriate time to diagnose anything. You know, the patient has a, a two-sided pneumonia or, you know, they were just in a severe uh, car wreck with multiple fractures um, and they're feeling sad. And, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the patient may be mentioned, you know, this is so upsetting. I'm in so much pain. I, you know, I wonder what it would be like not to be here. And, um, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, startles a lot of people and a lot of other uh, specialties of medicine. So we kind of get called to get to the bottom of it. But, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, seeing a psychiatrist, a therapist, psychotherapist, uh, you know, uh, and being told that they, they don't have anything is, uh, you know, is equally beneficial as uh, treating something that's not there. So, um, you know, whatever it is in medicine, you always want to think about the flip side of that coin. So, um, you know, it took me a while to kind of, you know, pick up on that, but uh, I see it on a day-to-day -day basis for sure. Do you, do you notice that, um, you know, some of the patients that uh, you're seeing or have been referred to you for evaluation that you think uh, to yourself, you know, this is a patient that, has been um, presented with a stress, and this is an entirely normal human response to that stress, and that, that's the end of it. Absolutely, absolutely, William, and thanks for asking that question, because a lot of the clients I work with are court-ordered, whether it be through March Manac Court, Drug Court, um, FACES, which is another program within Delinquency Court, and so oftentimes I'm working with a client and they do something that gets them in trouble with the law, which happens fairly often because the population I work with, they struggle, they, they, they struggle with behavioral issues. Um, and all of a sudden, the court will say now, they were working with me in treatment, they were, they were moving forward, but there was problems in the home. The court doesn't care about that. Now, all of a sudden, they're saying, oh, now you have to go to school. Now you have to get a job. Now you have to do 30 hours of community service every month. And now, um, on top of that, you have to test clean. All of a sudden, the the client will get really stressed out and you'll see them um, go backwards almost instead of forward because the court system presented all this. Now there's so much pressure at an age of 15 or 16 to do this and complete it. Um, and so sometimes they'll, they'll start meeting the criteria after a couple of weeks of the incident that 
that now they're presented with all these duties from the legal system. They start, you know, they start uh, lacking sleep. They start all of a sudden the, the little bit that they were doing. Now they're doing nothing. They, they're getting out of their routine. And it's just that the court system didn't really help in that situation by saying, now you have to do all of this. The client was already struggling. So um, I'm 100% with you that sometimes um, someone refer me uh, saying that this client is struggling with, uh, with this, with that, they meet the criteria for this, but it's really just situational. If you look, if you really look at them as an individual and what's going on in their life. So I'm 100% with you, William. And with that, I hope you don't mind if we jump a little bit for the audience and we talk about how does depression actually present itself? Because we talked about the difference between situational and clinical depression, you know? Um, but how does depression, uh, actually, uh, present itself. And you mentioned that you have to meet at least five of the criteria there in the, from the DSM five. And when it, when it comes to major depressive disorder and some of them, I'm just going to mention it to the audience. Some of the, uh, some of the ways it presents itself straight out of the DSM five, um, depressed mood or constant irritability. You talked about that, William significantly, mm -hmm. significantly reduced interest or feeling no pleasure in activities. You mentioned that William significant weight loss or weight gain a decrease or increase in appetite. Maybe they're coping by eating or they're not eating at all. Insomnia or increased desire to sleep. It's funny how they go from one extreme to the other. Restlessness or slowed behavior. Loss of energy. You mentioned that, William. And feelings of worthlessness and loss of self-confidence. And loss of self-confidence. These are just some of the few ways it can present itself. Um, but let's go a little bit into detail about each one and explain to the audience why they can be it's not a one size fits all. Everybody experiences depression differently, um, whether it be through age groups or whether it be just because from an individualistic, unique standpoint, um, someone may handle depression by not sleeping at all and thinking about um, the unpleasantness, unpleasantness of what just happened or whatnot, or someone may actually just want to sleep it off. Um, from your experience, William, you have a lot more experience when it comes to depression than I do as a clinician. Um, what do you see? Because from what I've seen, it's not a one size fits all. Yeah. And I think, uh, uh, sometimes one where that, uh, you know, uh, drastic, uh, variability comes from is, you know, I, I kind of, in my mind, uh, divided by age group. Um, and there's no set categories, but you know, what I, what I usually see in the, uh, um, child and adolescent, uh, patients is that, um, you know, if they're, uh, presenting with symptoms of depression, I usually hear, um, you know, the overeating, so an increase of appetite, an increase of sleep, um, which uh, when you get to depression in the adults, you know, let's say somebody that's, you know, in the you know, 25 to 45 range, uh, you know, majority of the time you actually have a, a loss of sleep and loss of appetite. Um, so um, back in the, the day, they used to have uh, something that was designated as an atypical depression. Um, and what that was is a depression that was uh, presenting in a, a way that you wouldn't expect. So <clears throat> it addressed just those things where you, you have a, you know, depressed uh, patient with a, um, increased appetite or um, sleeping 12, 14 hours a night and uh, then napping during the day. So um, they've kind of uh, done away with that terminology. Um, but, you know, I, I see also, you know, as we kind of migrate to the, um, the upper decades of, you know, let's say, you know, late 40s to early 60s, I see a lot of times, um, you know, depression actually presenting as a, you know, uh, decreased physical activity, maybe even a pain, uh, you know, just uh, general, um, uh, you know, fog that kind of has uh, rolled into uh, their life. Um, uh, there's an incredible memoir um, uh, by a patient, uh, an author by the name of uh, William, I think it's Stylon, um, called Darkness Visible. Um, and it's an incredible portrayal of a, uh, you know, kind of depression as it's rolling in. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a segment in this 20 page memoir that talks about how depression, uh, was worse at certain parts of the day, uh, for this, for this man, um, where he talked about how, um, usually, uh, for him, it was like the early afternoon, 
So maybe like just before uh, the sun even started to set, described it as like a, a, a poisonous fog bank rolling in on his mind. So very, very vivid uh, uh, terminology. And, um, and it's incredible how common that is. I, I hear that quite a bit where patients will tell me that they can, they can pinpoint um, where uh, in their day the, the mood is the worst. So that's an interesting question to uh, ask your you know, patients, and I see it in tra- uh, child and adolescents as well. Um, and a lot of what I've heard is I've, uh, you know, as uh, the day starts to wind down to a close and you kind of, uh, you know, lose some of these external stimuli, such as your work life, and, you know, um, it can be very quiet, uh, and the quiet in a depressed patient can be deafening. Um, so, you know, the lack of stimulus is also uh, can provoke an anxiety. And we talked about how, you know, depression and anxiety have a major, major overlap. But um, the last thing I'll end with, uh, you know, kind of uh, dividing up the age groups is when you get past the age of 60 and you're screening a patient for depression, uh, this is the point in which you have uh, cognitive uh, disturbance. So, you know, even the ability to uh, do higher level thinking, uh, you know, for 65 year olds uh, may notice uh, difficulty balancing the checkbook or paying, uh, paying bills on time or, you know, a uh, complex task where they have to go to the bank, they have to go to the grocery store, they need to pick up the dog, pick up dinner, then come home. They, they'll tell you, you know, you know, the last couple of times I, I had to run errands on Saturday morning, you know, I, I forgot to go to the grocery store altogether. You know, I'm not, I'm not forgetting the milk, I'm forgetting to go to the store. So that's got to, you know, peak your uh, attention for, you know, screening depression because it has cognitive disturbances as well. And I think a lot of the, uh, the public, uh, and I didn't really know that until uh, uh, after med school. So it's not something that's well known. Yeah, and, and I like the way that you that you separated it by age groups, um, even though it's not a one size fits all, even within the own age group itself. Mm -hmm. But you talked about how it presents itself differently by age group and the symptoms. You said teens and children, they, they have trouble at school. They start, you said they sleep a little bit more. Um, They lose, uh, they they lose interest in things they used to do. So if they used to love basketball, they start playing it less. And you talked about the, the middle adults and how the young adults sometimes too, um, through uh, they stop hanging out with their friends and and different ways it presents itself but it'll present itself in different ways and the cause or the root let's say because there's causes by infinity amounts but the root uh is a better term also differs within between age groups and the way i can say it is for example a child or a teenager um depression can uh, they can start meeting the criteria for depression if their parents are going through a divorce but not so much as a young adult or an adult Maybe they start struggling financially, or maybe they broke, they just, they're in the middle of the divorce themselves, or they're about to lose their house, or they're struggling with payments, and all of a sudden, the symptoms of depression will start to arise. So it's not only the way it presents itself as far as symptoms differ by age groups, but also the cause or the root, the root of where it all stems from as well. Um, and that's that, uh, William, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you once again, and is that I work with adolescents and, and um, teenagers. So that's my specialty and young adults as well. My experience isn't too much in, with adults and, and older individuals and seniors. So have you seen that as well, that the root of it um, also differs by the age group? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, just as life, uh, you know, uh, lays out for us, you know, um, you know, I think that it's very important to realize that, of course, you know, a lot of, you know, adolescents, let's say, you know, uh, ages 11 to, you know, 16 or so, um, you know, these, these uh, children don't have the uh, financial stress that maybe somebody that is just out of college and has a, a you know, large amount of uh, student loan debt and uh, challenge, uh, you know, having obstacles to find a job. But, you know, these um, what children have uh, stressors that, um, you know, kids in the 80s never had. I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, with uh, uh, social media and uh, a lot of, uh, um, you know, what is being, um, you know, forecasted or uh, broadcast, uh, I should say, uh, on the news, you know, these uh, kids have exposures um, to uh, things and access to information that is, 
as brilliant as it is dangerous, you know. So um, when I'm covering the child and adolescent consults, I, the bullying is at an all-time high. Um, and, you know, with Instagram, Facebook, and so forth, uh, a lot of times the bullying uh, doesn't end when, you know, the child gets off the school bus. It can spill over into the home life and then affect that realm of their uh, upbringing. So, you know, definitely I think that, you know, you always want to, you know, work with the patient to try to drill down to, you know, what was the tipping point that one, you thought to yourself, um, you know, I, something's got to be going on, you know, uh, maybe I'm depressed or uh, parents or best friends pointed out, you know, sometimes, um, you know, depression has a way of kind of sneaking up on us. Um, so, you know, the uh, I hear it all the time that, you know, the husband and wife, uh, uh, you know, the wife wants the husband to come in and really he didn't realize anything's wrong. And, you know, she's pointing out in the, the interview that, uh, you know, he's only showering once a week and he didn't even, you know, he's basically uh, been so overwhelmed by the depressed uh, state that uh, really didn't even notice it or didn't, uh, didn't think that it was something that, uh, you know, even needed to be addressed. Um, William, I, I, this, this, we can fit this with the categories of, of age groups on, on the symptoms of depression and, yeah. and the root of it. But I'm pulling up here from the National Institute of Mental Health that approximately 10% of the United States population is suffering from depression, which is 10 times more than those suffering from bipolar dis disorder and schizophrenia. Well, we know that uh, depression is the most diagnosed mental, di mental, mental disorder there. And why do I say this from the National Institute of Mental Health is because it's the most diagnosed, but do you think that the reason it's the most diagnosed is because it's easier to meet the symptoms of le for, for depression than it is, let's say, anxiety? Because from what I remember last week on our podcast on the DSM-5, for anxiety, the symptoms have to be met for longer than two weeks, way longer, I think, uh, um, uh, quite a bit more than two weeks. And for depression, it's only two weeks. Does that have anything to do with it? So... Um you know, that's always, a, you know, a good, it's a really good question and it's a, it's a good pickup because, um, you know, when we talked about like a generalized anxiety, um, you know, they place that timeline at six months. So, um, you know, the reason that you don't want uh, depression to carry on for six months before it's uh, diagnosed is because it can be uh, extremely lethal in a lot of different ways. And um, it is, it is, um, you know, the most common reason for time out of work across the board in the US. So you take all of the chronic pain, you take these terminal, um, you know, illnesses, you take, uh, you know, all of the, you know, pathologies that we have across the medicine and major depressive disorder is the most common um, reason that uh, people, patients do not go to work. Okay, so I think that, um, you know, when uh, my parents were, you know, in their 20s or 30s, uh, depression, um, as the word represents, did not exist. You know, that was a, um, you know, a, a society and, a, you know, time when it was just, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, uh, you know, get through it, um, you know, uh, brush it off, uh, you know, and uh, people didn't talk about this, uh, this stuff. And, um, you know, that's the part of the reason why psychiatry and mental health is so many years behind, you know, back in the, you know, let's say sixties, you know, if you had a pneumonia and you were in the hospital and you got out of the hospital and your neighbor asked you, you know, where have you been? You say, I was in the hospital for pneumonia. Um, somebody goes to the hospital for uh, depression, it's like there's this, this big uh, hush about it. You know, uh, you want this letter for when you get back to work, you don't want it to say what kind of hospital. Uh, you don't want it to, you know, say the reason that you were there. Please don't tell me uh, or don't say anything that it was, uh, had to do with my mood or my uh, sleep. Um, but really, it's it, as quiet and as quiet as people want it, it is more common than everything else combined. So, 
Um, it, it's fascinating in that regard as it carries this, uh, this shame um, with it that it should never have. But, um, you know, we're, we're still learning a lot about it. Uh, so um, I think that one of the best things that has happened is that, you know, we realize that, you know, when you take a depression and you have somebody that can't sleep and you have somebody that has no appetite, you know, these are, these are symptoms that have separate treatments if needed. And those symptoms of not sleeping, um, not eating are as real as, you know, the symptoms of uh, fever in somebody that has bacteria in their bloodstream or a cough in somebody that has an upper respiratory infection. So these are real symptoms. They're physical. Um, and the, you know, the mind-body connection will never be able uh, to separate it. There's a huge stigma. Yeah, it's absolutely. And, and, and you're absolutely right when you say that's why mental health is so far behind uh, the field because not, even now uh, there's, there's a hush-hush about it. It's not even yeah. just in the 60s. Even now there's a hush-hush about it. It's just now where people are starting to become more aware that this is a real thing. And there's still young people who believe, oh, uh, that person just isn't strong. They're weak. But it's actually much more than that. And uh, hopefully the school systems can start implementing a class where they can teach how the body works, how the mm -hmm. mind works, because they're so the way it's constructed. Now there's no teaching on how this organism as a whole functions. So we can see the signs of depression when they appear on somebody, which is something that I was going to get into now. Um, I was, I'm a big uh, follower of psychology today and psychology today has an article called smiling depression. And they even have a term for it, which is appearing happy to others, literally smiling, while literally suffering from depressive symptoms, which is why depression often times goes undetected. Those suffering from it often discount their own feelings and brush them aside. They might not even be aware of their depression or want to acknowledge their symptoms. And I wonder how much of that, William, has to do with the fact that as a young person, you're by especially, let's put myself as an example, an Hispanic family, there is no uh, oh, you feel sad, uh, stay down and, and lay in bed. No, no, no. It's more of like you feel down, you get sad, you better get back up real quick, real quick. And if not, mm -hmm. you're going to get screamed at. So how much of that has to do with something? Um, smiling depression isn't in the DSM-5, but it's a term used to almost say we're, we're, it's a person smiling that is wearing a mask. They're really struggling inside. When no one's looking, they're crying. Um, I wonder how much of that is correlated with what the National Institute of Mental Health says that really about 10% of the population here in the U.S. is struggling with the symptoms of depression. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, uh, part of it is that, you know, there's this belief in that if you uh, decide that you're sad and then you go see somebody, and whether it's your family doctor or, you know, psychiatrist or uh, psychologist, you go see somebody and then they say, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z, I think that you're depressed. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people feel as though that they've now been diagnosed with depression and, uh, you know, they're always going to have it. So there's this belief system in that, you know, you think, well, if I admit to myself that I'm depressed, then I'll actually be depressed. But if I never acknowledge it, um, you know, what you then end up with is, um, you know, almost like a denial. You know, if, if I don't ever think that I'm depressed, maybe I'll never actually be depressed. But then what you have is you have this space between how you're feeling and how you admit that you're feeling. And what happens, it just uh, keeps filling up with things that are, uh, you know, causing you, you to feel one way or another. So I think that, um, you know, Depression can really uh, cause so many different um, ailments in everyday life that sometimes it's, uh, it's hard to admit, uh, you know, and um, I think that, you know, it's always been my humble opinion that if you catch it early on, you know, if this is somebody that says, you know, last month was, you know, very difficult. I was hoping that after I got through this project at work, um, you know, I would snap back to my good old self and then the second month, you know, I'm seeing them, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is the depression that is easier treated than the depression that is swept under the rug for, 
you know, 12 months. And then, you know, after the holidays, when the patient is still not coming around, you, you have a year's worth of, uh, you know, uh, stressors to rake through and try to figure out the best way to get them back to, uh, back to their baseline. So, and, and thanks for sharing this, William. And, and we've spent a lot of time already on this podcast. So I didn't realize that and I'm going to try to keep going forward with all the subtopics that we have here. And this is such an interesting topic and you're very knowledgeable about it. It's honestly an honor to have you on this podcast. Um, let's let, if you don't mind, I'd like to read more research concerning depression and sure. research, um, published by JAMA psychiatry and a new study on the epidemiology of major depressive disorder finds that people with a history of the condition are more, more likely to have, a history of substance use disorders disorders than anxiety or personality disorders. This is the newest, one of the newest research. And obviously this is from JAMA Psychiatry. So maybe some, maybe um, another publisher has different research, but I'm going to keep going. The study published online in JAMA Psychiatry looked at the occurrence of depression and other psychiatric disorders over the lifetime of more than 36,000 adults, as well as occurrence within the last 12 months. Among those with a lifetime history of MDD, 57.9% had a history of substance use disorder. 57.9, William. 37.3 had a previous, uh, had a history of anxiety, of previous anxiety disorder. And 31.9 had a history of a personality disorder. Brain scans now can show clear cut distinctions between anxiety disorders and depressive disorders. So, and they can also show the history of alcohol use disorder and nicotine use disorder. Uh, William, I wanted to jump into comorbidities sure. and substance use is my specialty. I consider it. I mean, I work in the field every day uh, with other professionals in the field as well. They're saying this, this latest study, because I saw other research that shows that anxiety is, is almost, and I think we talked about that last podcast. It's the close, it's gets diagnosed the most alongside with depression, and anxiety alongside each other. But this is saying otherwise. This is saying that those that are struggling with depression or meet the criteria for depression are also struggle with substance use disorders more often than not. Has that been your experience? Because I, it's been my experience, but I think it's been my experience more because of the sheer fact that I work in the substance use field. So I'm, all the clients I see are going to be struggling with a substance use disorder. Yeah, I mean, I, I really see it on, on both sides of it. Um, you know, I think that um, part of this, uh, this stigma that, uh, you know, we've, we've mentioned a few times here, um, you know, if you, if you don't, uh, you know, want to really acknowledge that you're, you're having uh, an irritability or uh, guilt without reason or your energy is, you know, just terrible and you can't focus at work, if, if you notice that's there um, and it's not being addressed, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, not everyone, but patients can, um, you know, uh, develop, uh, you know, ways to kind of treat or cope with some of these uh, pervasive feelings, um, some of which may be, you know, uh, alcohol. You know, if you have, uh, you know, uh, a few drinks and you typically only drink once every couple months, and now you're drinking, you know, five, six alcoholic drinks at night. You notice, wow, you know what? I can fall asleep after that, so my sleep's no longer a problem. Or yeah, so so you're saying you're saying that that um, the research can be accurate because it's not necessarily that the people that are struggling with the symptoms of depression are are addicts per se from the beginning. It's more that they're self medicating and they're self medicating with substance with substances for their depression for the for the symptoms that they're experiencing such as maybe like you said sleep better someone might smoke a joint or two to help them sleep better at night um because they're struggling with insomnia because and which is part of the many symptoms of depression is that accurate yeah absolutely i mean of course you know the cannabis the alcohol you know uh, a friend's uh, xanax or you know even um caffeine uh, you know, all of these things that if you're not having much energy and you start taking caffeine and then before you know it, you're uh, asking for somebody's Adderall or stimulants, you're, you're you know, basically, uh, you know, kind of developing ways 
to treat the symptoms without, you know, acknowledging, well, you know, why am I feeling like this? Why can't I sleep? Why am I anxious? Why am I depressed? So, um, and I, I think, it, you know, it's, you know, chicken or the egg as well. You know, if there was an initial, you know, heavy alcohol consumption, you know, the body can only withstand so much and, you know, without appropriate time to recover, um, you can start losing some of that motivation that um, you once had or your concentration. And what didn't used to make you upset is now, you know, ticking you off without uh, much notice. You have this very short fuse and you don't know why. And really you realize, wow, you know, I, I drank a, a pint of uh, liquor last night. I didn't sleep well. I woke up irritable. And now I'm uh, kind of, uh, you know, taking it out at uh, the coworkers at the uh, hospital or at the convenience store, wherever it is. And, and sometimes, though, sometimes if someone's using too much, right, they can also start meeting the symptoms for depression. And it's because with using comes, you have to hide it from your family, comes an identity crisis, or, or, and it also contributes to um, a change in neurological connection, chemical imbalance. So it can be one or the other, go both ways. But it's funny how they're, correl they're so heavily correlated and more than what people think. It's not that someone that's struggling with depression and all of a sudden they pick up drinking it's not that that person's weak. It's not that that person doesn't know what's going on. It's that that person's really struggling and they're self-medicating because there might be a stigma attached and they can't tell their family or their family doesn't see depression as a real medical condition when it is. And so that's a uh, very good information for the public, William, because if you're out there and you're struggling with depression, um, be conscious of what's going on. You know, you don't want to try and pick up drinking or anything. Now, William, I was thinking um, to talk about whether to talk about treatment for treatment modalities and the best course of treatment for depression or to talk about how it can be prevented. But do you mind if we talk about how it can be prevented? Because oftentimes, um, mostly in Eastern cultures, they see depression as someone who's obviously their mind's out of control. Uh, I try keeping this podcast the most clinically oriented as possible, especially since we have you on as a guest, but they see someone's mind as out of control and mm -hmm. there's mindful ways of approaching it to help with the symptoms of depression. And so as a psychotherapist, I actually work with my clients and I try seeing how their schedule works to see how we can sometimes work together for them to make an adjustment in their life that may contribute to some, some changes. And I'm going to mention some exercise because Studies have shown that regular exercise can be affected in treating depression as medication. It can, I don't want to say that it can be used as a substitute because that'd be doing um, the field some injustice, but definitely that should take an effect. If someone's not engaging in exercise, a daily exercise or, or enough for the day or, or the week, then all of a sudden they may be more sad. But sometimes just doing a little bit of exercise can kick up those endorphins and affect that area of the brain that's responsible for dopamine release. So how about social support? Maybe if someone, a strong social support network reduces isolation, a key risk factor for depression, nutrition, eating well is important for both you, your physical and mental health, eating small, well-balanced meals throughout the day will help you keep your energy up and minimize mood swings. So if I'm sitting down, William, and I'm eating huge, huge carb heavy meals, maybe I'm eating, uh, who knows, maybe two or three cheeseburgers in just one sitting. After I'm done eating, I am going to feel loss of energy. I am going to feel uh, like if I don't want to do anything else, and almost like, and maybe, and maybe I want to go straight to sleep or not, or not sleep. Um, I'm going to mention two more. Sure. Uh, stress reduction, such as making changes in your life to help manage and reduce stress, maybe choosing what's important, and sleep. Obviously, I'm not saying these things will prevent depression, because, but these things can help cope with depression, I feel like. And sometimes the lack of these five uh, things I mentioned can, can maybe impact depression or make it more relevant or someone to meet the symptoms or the criteria for it. Um, I'm not sure though that maybe this is more of an Eastern philosophy, although nutrition really does affect the way the brain's functioning. Uh, do you have anything to say that to say about that as a psychiatrist, William? Yeah, I mean, those are those are definitely things you know I I personally will recommend before medicine. You know, um, 
you know, I've, I've never seen anybody tell me that, uh, you know, when the weather is nice and the sun is out and they're feeling stressed about the, the uh, homework assignment or the midterm or uh, the work presentation where they go outside and, you know, fresh air, sunlight for, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes, um, you know, and you live in Miami as well. So um, I think it's, you know, all of these things, you know, are important. It's a, it's a good thing to try. Um, and, you know, realize that, you know, maybe it can prevent, maybe it can uh, assist with, uh, you know, treating something that is there and yet to be diagnosed. But, you know, uh, water, nutrition, exercise, sunlight, um, fresh air. I mean, these are things that depression can have a way of, uh, you know, almost casting um, some uh, doubt that these things will uh, work. So, you know, it's always good. You mentioned support systems. You have a, a best friend uh, that's your first call and you say, you know, you know, I'm not feeling the way that I used to feel. Uh, you know, I can't clean up my house. I'm falling behind at work. You know, how do you feel about joining a gym or, you know, do you want to start, uh, do you want to start, um, you know, uh, going on evening walks for 30 or 40 minutes? Um, until uh, the weather gets cold, you know, so small things that, uh, you know, uh, can be forgotten, um, you know, is usually a good uh, uh, first step, uh, you know, before we kind of uh, uh, jump to, uh, you know, any kind of uh, extreme measures. But um, you mentioned, I mean, there's, there's so many different uh, avenues uh, and uh, modalities that we can talk about uh, regarding depression. So, um, you know, uh, see what your uh, community thinks, uh, Juan, but we may need to uh, um, do a depression uh, 2.0 or phase two. Um, and when we talk about, uh, you know, some of the uh, treatments or, you know, uh, go down some of the, um, the newer wave uh, approaches to um, what cognitive behavioral therapy has developed into and some of the uh, medicines that are available. Um, so, um, you know, it's an all important time to be in uh, psychiatry, mental health, uh, uh, psychology. Um, you know, people are at an all time um, high level of stress, uh, whether it's the economy or the media. Um, so, you know, we all need help, but, uh, you know, it's important to not let things uh, go too far. You know, I think that's, you know, you did a, a good job at emphasizing that, you know, be thinking about the everyday things that you can do. Um, before this, you know, uh, depression unravels and, you know, it, it's hard to reel things back. So, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you sharing that research with me. Oh, no, please, uh, William. I think um, you're right when, it's, when you say maybe we need to do this a 2.0 because there's a lot to touch on here uh, with uh, the type of treatment modalities. And just, for example, the American Psychiatric Association, like I was reading earlier right off their, their page, I had written down in my notes that, um, depression affects the way a person thinks, acts, and uh, thinks, acts, and feels. And that's kind of go correlates right with uh, CBT, which is why CBT tends to have such an effective, uh, effective, uh, like a effective way of treating depression, or as has shown compared to other treatment orientations, because it actually targets the thinking, the feeling, and the acting. So. William, I think we should leave it off right here for the audience. Um, I think this was a good podcast, to be honest with you, and rich in information. And we might need to do a 2.0 so we can talk about the different types. And, and those that are interested in psychiatry and psychology can understand the different types of treatment orientations, treatment modalities that uh, we use to help those struggling with depression. And if there's anyone's going to get anything out of anything uh, out of this podcast today, I hope that it's that depression is a real clinical symptom. It should be diagnosed by a professional. You shouldn't be going around self-diagnosing yourself just because you meet, read the criteria. And I hope people understand that uh, we have to break the stigma because if we don't, then there's never going to be real help and there's not going to be enough resources for those that are actually struggling. Um, what do you think, William? Yeah, no, I, I, I think you said it really well, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of these scales on the internet, um, screen yourself for depression. And, you know, um, there's, there's a way to kind of evaluate these symptoms and, you know, self-diagnosis is, 
you know, like we said, you have to be aware of how you're feeling, but, uh, you know, it's better to get an outside perspective, you know, so, um, you know, having somebody, uh, you know, kind of ask uh, questions from, you know, an outside lens looking in is the best way to, you know, kind of get to the root of, uh, you know, what's bothering an individual. So, um, you know, I'm excited. We still have lots, you know, to talk about. I've been getting a lot of questions, you know, there's, these uh, infusions now that are coming out for postpartum depression, not even anything that we talked about yet. Um, ketamine is all over the media as uh, some new treatment modalities for, uh, you know, treating some of this refractory depression. So um, it would be good to touch on the details of treatment. So uh, I'd look forward to, uh, you know, getting back and talking further about this. Thanks for coming on, William. And thank you for everybody who's tuned in thus, uh, thus far and through the whole podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I hope you guys are um, hearing some good stuff, some valuable information. And um, thanks a lot, William. I really appreciate it. You're a very knowledgeable person, man. And uh, it's truly an honor to speak with you every time. And I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. No, I am. My heart, whichever one you want to put it. That's right. So we'll, uh, you know, definitely continue this. It's always a pleasure being on. And, um, you know, the more we talk about this, the, the more we diminish that stigma. So I'm looking forward to uh, future topics and um, touching on the depression once again. Thanks, William. Have a great night, okay? And good night. Good night, everybody.